so excited to be back, and what a wonderful time of year. This is, this is the regeneration of the world happens now. Isn't it the first day of spring? I think tomorrow is the vernal equinox, and it's the celebration of Holi, which is a wonderful, wonderful kind of time of year. Um, so when I was here last year, I was actually heading up design at Walmart, and this was my Walmart design team. And what I love about connecting with the design spirit and soul of this crew is that when you actually give them the permission to do bold things, you see a new side of the design team. And uh, so we're here uh, now in a new capacity, now at a 324-year-old Victorian-era British bank, which of course is the place you go to do design, right? And we're going to be setting up kind of a new design team here as well. Um, so I'm so excited to be with you guys. Um, I'm, as a designer, my whole goal and, and, and focus is to bring moments of joy and impact into people's lives. And so you can imagine after a career of working at Microsoft on the original Surface, does anyone remember, by the way, when Surface, before it was a tablet, it was a big ass table? Do you guys remember this like era? Yeah. So such an interesting project around how to connect human beings to technology without keyboards and mice and a new, and a new way. So, you know, doing a lot of that work, I, at Google, I worked on this thing called Project Aura, which is a modular phone. I'll talk a little bit more about what that was about and, and why I think that's important to banking. So you can imagine, having done all of that, and for the last 10 years I've been in Silicon Valley, um, and my last project was actually doing a redesign of Walmart.com, which I talked a little bit about last year at Agile India. Um, you know, it's been a little bit challenging for me now to say that I am a banker because somehow being a designer and being a banker, it's just, it doesn't feel like those two things go together. And, but I wanted to talk to you today about why I think it's so extraordinary to bring together the left brain and the right brain, you know, creativity and humanity with finance. Any of you guys in banking or financial services in the audience? A couple of you guys? Cool. So I am now at Lloyd's Banking Group, which I don't know if many of you know about. Lloyd's Banking Group is not a large global bank. They're actually only focused on the UK. And their mission is to help Britain prosper. And it was interesting, when I first learned about this mission, being a designer from Silicon Valley, you know, I, my bullshit meter started to go off a little bit. You know, like, is, do you really mean that mission? Or isn't banking just about helping make wealthy bankers more wealthy? And you kind of really screw people? Isn't that really financial services is what, what it's about? And as I dug deeper, I learned that this is a really deeply felt mission at Lloyd's Banking Group. And, and the founding of Lloyd's Banking Group has a lot to do with giving access to finances in society. It was actually one of the first institutions that gave uh, savings accounts to everyday people in an era when you had to have like a 10 pound note to open up a savings account as a wealthy individual. They allowed uh, pence accounts so that ordinary people can actually get access to financial services. Um, a couple of quick examples of it. Um, we just a couple of months ago did a workshop with some of the nonprofits um, and small organizations that work with Lloyd's to help them on their journey of understanding digital skills. We partner up with Google Digital Academy, and we, we really want them to be able to just focus more of their time on their mission, less around managing the logistics of their business. Um, we care a lot about making finances inclusive to everybody within the UK. And what's so interesting about that focus on the UK is that we can actually go deep into vulnerable communities. You know, one of those communities is um, individuals who are facing critical illness. And uh, we have actually partnered with Macmillan, which is a nonprofit that helps individuals on their journey dealing with cancer. You know, I, I heard this stat from the team that's working with these guys that in their lifetime in the UK, 50% of everyone in the UK will face a cancer diagnosis at some point in time. I mean, it's kind of a shocking and striking statistic to learn about. And often as bankers, we think about people's numbers and finances and accounts, but when you face a critical illness, right after you deal with the medical possibilities, the next questions are, can I afford this? Is this gonna destroy 
my, my finances. And so we've actually done a lot to work with, um, our, pa with our customers who become patients. On average, our patients, uh, people who are, re are recognized um, as going through critical illness, they, they have a really special treatment within Lloyd's. We're able to actually postpone mortgage payments. We kind of you know, can waive fees. Our customers save on average 95 pounds a month, actually, when they're identified and they work with us. In fact, one of our customers, Tracy, um, really wanted people to know about this because people don't talk about critical illness and they don't talk about cancer. Um, and Tracy actually passed away a few months ago and she wanted her story to be told so that other people facing cancer could actually kind of get the, get the support they needed. So, I, so my bullshit meter was still there, but it, it, it eased off a little bit. And I realized here's an institution that does have a genuine desire to focus on this word prosperity. And you know, this word prosperity is a little interesting. First of all, when you ask people what does prosperity mean to them, they say, well, I never use that word. That's a weird word to use. Like, I don't just like, you know, talk about it in everyday language. But when I do use the word, word prosperity, um, I think about it in more human terms. And so as a designer, we, we came together. We have, there's about uh, 500 of us at Lloyd's Banking Group across all different yields of design. Design research, design strategy, service design, systems thinking. And we started to imagine what is our purpose within that organization? What does prosperity really mean to us? And we said very simply, we design for that. We design for prosperity, for the human side of that. Not the kind of like material acquisition side of what prosperity is, but the human side. And in fact, this is, we did some work in our studio about um, asking people what prosperity means. And they said, it's me, it's my loved ones, and it's events in my life that matter. And so this is actually using Lego and Play-Doh. Some of you know that we love Play-Doh. Um, and we, we're kind of having people map out their lives, and that's really what prosperity is all about. In fact, we define prosperity as helping people end the day just a bit better than it started. And that's really interesting because often we work in places where there's lots of innovation and hype and concepts, and we have these really you know, interesting visions, but they feel so vague or disconnected from our lives. So we wanted to have this definition to help ground us in what it can mean on a daily basis. Like, what actions can I take today to live a life that feels more fulfilled and my financial health can go, uh, can go up just a bit? Now, I have a confession to make. In addition to being a designer in banking, where I feel kind of not actually in, you know, always in the right environment, um, I grew up actually without any money. Um, and there's kind of, my, my dad was a designer, my mom was an actress. I was really into Star Wars when I was a kid that had just come out and we couldn't afford even buying like little Star Wars figurines. So my parents gave me like garbage bags and that middle picture is me trying to become a stormtrooper. Um, and I just remember, you know, just feeling like, I, I think I remember my parents fighting about money more than I remember them teaching me about it. And there's no public education around finances, at least not in the US or in the UK. I'm not sure about India. And we live in a society that glorifies the acquisition of material objects. And so when you bring together the taboo-ness of nature, the, the, ta the taboo nature of money, a society that glorifies physical things, you really end up with a situation that I think is best summarized by this Google search. Check this out. So, Autocomplete is a pretty brilliant data analytics snapshot in, in culture. So when you're typing finances are, Google's trying to like quickly shortcut you to the top terms related to finances. And so this is a data accurate snapshot of the most popular search items, right, around this topic. So for those in the back that can't read this, this is finances are ruining my marriage. That's number one. Finances are stressing me out, that's number three. A mess, are tight, out of control. So, in some ways, I feel like this is the perfect place to be a designer. Because we are so disconnected from our money that this, this is a wonderful place to be. And actually, I looked at some of the statistics in the UK, and this is pretty shocking. 
but in line with that disconnection. At any given time in the UK, 40% of adults are dealing with financial worries and stress. We lose 120 billion pounds a year in the UK because of that, the lost productivity re relating from that stress. And financial worries are a significant, it's the number one cited cause of divorce and a significant um, contributor to suicide. So uh, to me, I just got back from South by Southwest, actually in Austin. And I was at C you know, uh, CES in, in years past. And it just feels like this is the conversation that's happening in tech around finances. And I'm like, how can we have a conversation around FinTech when ordinary people just cannot make sense of finances? So to me, what I'm going to talk to you about today, if you saw in the title of this talk, FinTech or something, it was a little bit of a, you know, I'm not actually talking at all about blockchain or distributed ledgers or anything related to FinTech. What I'm talking about is how to bring humanity into banking. And I'm going to talk about just really three things, very simply. The first one is about designing with people, the second one is we have to create a new language, and the third one is how to tell a really good story with a really good metaphor. And all of the things I'm sharing with you today are in flight. It's a little bit, I'm a little bit vulnerable here because these are not like finished projects that have all been successful. Um, and in some ways I feel like this is the making of, like we have a team that's in the background working on this as we speak. And um, so, but let's start, let's get into it. So number one, designing with people. Who was here last year at my talk? You guys remember we did some Play-Doh? So the whole Play-Doh piece was how do we get ordinary people to create with us and give them design tools? So I'm not going to do another round of Play-Doh this year. I think we did enough toothbrushes last year. Um, but I just want, for those that are, are maybe new to this, um, my hero is Liz Sanders. Dr. Liz Sanders has really inspired the industry to think more about how do you bring people who you're designing for into the process. And the, the whole philosophy here is that there's no such thing as experience design. You can't design it for, you can't design experiences for people, it's in them. Um, and if you want to understand people, you have to understand that experiencing is this moment in time at the intersection of our memories from the past and our dreams for the future. And that's a really sacred moment that sometimes we don't even understand very deeply. We have to like tweets and Insta and Facebook stuff and I even, I don't, how many of you guys use Facebook? Everyone who's over the age of 40 just raise their hands. <laughs> um, there's this feature that shows you five years ago there was this memory that happened. I don't know about you, but like when I see those things, I have totally new appreciations for those moments, right? So if we're, if those moments are so hard to understand as designers and as engineers and as leaders, we have to be in humble deference to design for those experiences. And if you want to understand them, there's only three ways Liz says to do that. You can listen to what people say, you can see what people do, and you can experience what they make. And what people say is what, you know, most market research that you're all familiar with, interviews, surveys, one-on-ones, focus groups, all of that. What people do is kind of this really exciting domain of applying social science and psychology and anthropology into the world of software and design where you actually look at behavior. And then this third one is really interesting to me. It's like, what, what do people create when you give them the tools to make? Now, I won't go deep into this. This isn't a lecture. It is definitely post-lunch coma time. But the whole, the whole idea here is you want to get to people's deep knowledge. It's called latent or tacit knowledge. This is the stuff that's really important to us but hard to talk about. You can't get to that stuff with just basic interviews to hear what people say. If you want to get to what people know, think, or know, feel, and dream, you have to get them involved in making. So I gave an example last year, but I'll just share this one really quickly. Here's an example of kind of what that looks like. So when we were at Google creating this modular phone, the whole question was, what would people create if you gave them the tools to make? And if you, some of you may remember, we created this Velcro van covered with 4,000 linear feet of Velcro because you could, you know, it's like modular hardware. You can stick stuff to it and then change the design. 3D printers, hackable phones, laser cutters, basically a portable version of Arduino and Radio Shack. Um, and we tried to bring this to makers to see how do they want to create, what do they want to create. And we drove 14,000 miles across six months and 
created these experiences. And what we had an ochre bodysuit also, which was, which was great. By the way, you have to prototype. And of course, one of the things about Agile is this continuous improvement in learning. So one of the things we didn't do on this project, we didn't drive at night before we went on the road. And if you may remember this, our first road trip at night, we realized we actually attract a lot of insects driving a Velcro vehicle in the middle of the night. So prototype, prototype, prototype. Is the best thing. So we would, we would take this, this roving maker mobile and we would ask people, what do you want to create? And within a very short period of time, they would form teams, two days, it was a 48 hour hackathon. And I remember this, this one team, uh, this guy had gotten hit from behind as a bicyclist because the, the, the bicyclist behind him at night wasn't paying attention and didn't see that he was stopping. So this guy created a helmet that has accelerometers and it has red brake lights when he starts to slow down. And uh, so this was something that he actually ended up raising almost a million dollars on Kickstarter to support. And I just went to the Apple store a few months ago. And uh, this is actually one of, um, this is the second generation out of the Lumos helmet. So it's, it's so exciting to see what happens when you give ordinary people the tools to create, or, or even extraordinary people in this case. So at Lloyd's, we're doing this uh, in our studios. We've built customer labs, research centers, and all of our, you know, all of our design studios. And we use these as spaces of exploration and play. We have prototypes, of course, but we also have kind of Lego and Play-Doh, and we have people describe their lives and their relationships. And uh, one of the things we started to do is actually we brought in some game designers, and we had them do this activity around thinking about, instead of finances, well, what about actually thinking about people, what they care about? So that's what I mean by designing with people, and I encourage all of you no matter what industry you're in, is to put people into the heart of your process because really exciting things will come out. Um, for us, one of the exciting things coming out is creating a new design language. How many of you guys are engineers? Okay, so all of you engineers do this really well. You have this thing called a technical architecture. There's many different flavors of that, right? And you have actually code languages which has structured reusable components and syntax that helps pull together a whole engineering effort. Design has to be like that as well to be successful. So we've actually started to create a new design language. And in finance, we, we thought at first that these are the things that would be most important, like access to financial services from an inclusion perspective, or you know your financial well-being, like how, how, much, how many assets you have now and, and you know, what's your current financial state? Um, or literacy, the second one around capability. It turns out these things aren't actually that important to the goal of helping you end the day better than it started from a from prosperity angle. For example, we did a study where uh, um, we gave people basic financial literacy and then tracked their financial health, and it had a 0.01% impact on their financial health. And so I'm going to show with you today a hypothesis, but a pretty good working hypothesis. That's actually a Philip Joe's team, who's a member of the design team, who will be giving a workshop later on. I don't think he'll be talking about this stuff, but you can reach out to him afterwards. Um, these are the things that we're starting to talk about that actually help people make forward movement. And I'll go into each of these. They're kind of hard to read on this. Um, but before I do, I thought I would have the design leader on Philip's team that's leading the design language just tell you a bit about her personal story, because to us, that was the breakthrough that led us to discover this. My name is Lily Dart. I'm the design language delivery lead in the design team, and this is my story. Before I joined Lloyd, I had a really difficult two or three years. I had a relationship that went very wrong. My partner was actually having a breakdown himself and ended up developing quite a drug habit. My finances felt insecure, my relationships were insecure, and then on top of that, work became a horrible place to be as well. One day I walked into work and I disassociated. If you've not come across disassociation before, it's like you're still connected to your body, but it's really far away. So you don't really feel what's happening. You can't really connect with people in the same way. 
it's almost like you're in this bubble that's sort of adjacent to what your body's actually doing. I was frightened by it and I went home that day and ended up getting signed off work and put on medication. Although I had amazing friends and I had amazing family, the anxiety and depression wouldn't let me tell them what was going on. It's this horrible, vicious cycle where you need help and you need help more than you have done at any other point in your life. But your brain keeps on telling you that people will lose respect for you, that people will see you as the piece of trash that you are if you express that these things are going through your mind. So it was someone at work who had experienced similar problems before who managed to call me on what was going on and help me notice when I was experiencing particularly bad days. By being able to talk to him about it and being able to talk to my therapist about it, eventually I managed to open up to everyone else in my life who have since been absolutely amazing. We're not always ready, and in fact most of us aren't for quite a long time, ready to go, right, okay, I need therapy now. Often what we need to do is talk to other people and put into context our feelings. And when we start to play our emotions back to other people, often we start to see truths that we can't see on our own. But if you don't have that conversation about these things are going on and this is the way that I feel, you will keep on underplaying the seriousness of what you are experiencing. Experience. And now that she's actually in charge of leading this fundamental design language around helping people connect with their finances, we started to think actually more deeply about what, it, what, what do we have to do to become more human. And so here are the four things that are starting to emerge beyond just the basics of just understanding the numbers of your finances. Um, so the first one is actually around having a goal orientation. Um, you guys may have heard about this famous Harvard study where uh, graduates um, were kind of asked about their goals. Did they write them down and what they were? And it turns out, and they tracked those folks, there was one cohort that didn't really write down their goals, goals and was one that did. And it turns out that when we're actually really specific about our goals and we write them down, we're actually much more likely to achieve them, or at least to be conscious about the process. And so and when it comes to financial health, this, is, this turns out to be something that's pretty important. Right, if you ask someone, do you want to be financially healthy, they'll say yes. And then if you'll say to them, what is the next step you need to take to do that? They'll be like, I have no freaking idea, right? So trying to make that concrete is, is, is key. The second one is about conscientiousness. And all of these are on a spectrum. So what, what we mean by this is, I don't know if any of you guys saw the marshmallow challenge. You ever see this where kids were given a marshmallow? And they were like said, they were said, they were told, if you wait for a couple of minutes, I'll come back and I'll bring you two marshmallows, or you can eat it now. And they tracked the kids that just gobbled it up right away, and the ones that you know, you know showed restraint. And it turns out, um, on the one hand, it's impulsive behavior, right? It's like, what are you talking about? There's a marshmallow in front of me. I'm just going to eat it, right? That's impulsivity. For someone who can kind of hold off that raw impulse and actually be more thoughtful about and be conscientious about it, it turns out that that, fr that mental frame of mind actually, as you can imagine, helps with finances as well, right? And um, so that, that's really key. The third one is around optimism, and this might sound obvious, but when people are dealing with financial difficulty or life difficulty, their natural amount of optimism or pessimism has a huge effect on things. And we often forget this in a bank when we give you regulated statements and communications and just we communicate you in a very dry way. Forget how important sometimes it is to just tell somebody, I know this is a rough month. Someone in your family had an illness and you had to pull, you had to take out credit card debt, but you can do this and we can help and call us anytime and we've got your back. Like, I don't ever remember a bank talking to me like that. And it turns out when you have more optimism, you're much more likely to have the right kind of behaviors to get into that a good, healthy financial state. And the last one, this one's really interesting. This one is around, do we see ourselves as an agent of change, being able to control our world? Or do we actually think about everything else around us is what has control? We learned this from a London School of Economics professor who 
normally tasks, is tasked with understanding the effectiveness of social impact giving, right? So the Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation will give 150 million to what, elevate the status of women in West African villages, and they will do a before and after survey, and they'll ask people, do you feel in control of the changes that you can make to make your life better? And if people feel like they're not in control, then they kind of act that way. If they feel like they are in control and it's on them, then there's a lot more agency. So this is a totally new landscape for us. And some of you guys tell me to Agile India, like why the hell isn't this guy talking about DevOps and like, you know, how we can do technology better. It, it turns out like this really messy human stuff is pretty darn important to the actual tactical nuts and bolts of managing your finances. And so we're starting to think about how do we create personas. Um, you know, Alan Cooper, of course, was here last year and, and thinking about how the evolution of that space. We're trying to think about these mindsets and how might we do things differently for different people depending on where they're at. So a Christopher who doesn't have as much uh, kind of confidence, financial confidence and financial agency, kind of might require a different way of being connected to and communicated with. Whereas a Roxanne, who is higher on some of those locus of control and optimism, she just really needs a, kind of a high five and a like, you're on track, kind of go for it, right? And she actually doesn't need a lot of the detail. And so the question for us is, how do we create a design system in finance that works like this? So here's one example. Some of our customers have repeated patterns of going into overdraft, which is kind of an early sign for getting into financial difficulty and you can spiral out of control with all the fees and all of that. So one of our suggestions is, well, let's take someone who isn't very conscientious, who's kind of failing the marshmallow challenge in their own financial life, and, you know, and, and that, at the particular time of the, of the month when they're more likely to go into overdraft, maybe just, or, or a week before, send them a notification and say, hey, just heads up, here's some upcoming bills that are coming out, just so you might be aware, right? so that we can, as a system, we can hold some of that conscientiousness for you. So you don't have to change who you are. You can just be your natural, kind of more careful financial self and just have the system kind of help give some nudges that would result in you just being a little bit more conscientious, perhaps that week, so that you don't have to get that notification from us if you went into overdraft, right? So be a little more proactive. We're starting to think about goal setting in a new way. For a lot of us, like, setting goals can be hard or specific, having being specific. So why not use all of the data we have around your transactions and then proactively recommend to you a couple of specific goals, which you can change at any time. And again, nudge and prompt you to adjust those. And then finally, why don't we just give you more encouragement and high fives instead of like, hey, you just went into overdraft and you know, this, that's not really good and here's what you need to do. Like, why don't we just actually, the months that you don't go into overdraft, give you a high five and think about loyalty program or rewards to encourage you on that journey. And then the other thing in our language, and again, this is, these, this is an early prototype thinking, but all of banking information is about the past when you think about it, our monthly statements, all of our transaction stuff. And what if we, and you can't really change the past, I mean, you can get insights in the past, but what if we started to think about an interface that you know, maybe this is now, and the majority of the interface was about the future. So we can start to get predictive about your spend line. We can kind of start to put on icons of different kind of repeated bills that are coming out and just start to engage with you on that process of thinking about the future in a new way. And then of course, we're thinking about the you know, machine intelligence and AI and virtual assistants where you can kind of go from asking a chatbot a question to realizing that's actually a human conversation to then actually going to directly into a branch kind of face-to-face -face conversation. So how do we have a design language that intercedes in the right places for you at the right time? And again, I'll show you something really that's in prototype phase, but when you think beyond mobile, what would a more dashboard-like space look like? And I remember we were looking at some of these comps and someone says, well, you know, this isn't Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat. Like, why do you have, it's, you know, why do you have someone's photo on there? It's just their banking account. We're like, well, if we want to get people connected to their finances, why not actually set the expectation, this is my finances? 
So again, you can see things here around my goals and my life and dashboards and kind of the future. But anyway, just I want to. This is kind of what it's starting to look like tangibly for us. Is how do we take the financial system, which is really difficult to understand, and make it more simple? And I'm going to wrap up with um, about storytelling and about metaphor. So stories are fundamental to us. Um, stories have been used ever since there were human beings to communicate values and culture and expectations. And so at a bank, we realized that that's kind of missing with your finances. And so we ended up, we actually built an experiment. We created a storytelling team with filmmakers, with storyboard artists, with screenwriters, and like they've done some pretty incredible stuff. Here's a little sampling of this 23 person storytelling team just over the past three months. storytelling teams that are awesome is they just make everything that they touch look just more epic, right? Um, and so one of the things that we did is we took the entire roadmap of 200 OKRs across the whole group transformation at Lloyds Bank and Group. And, you know, touching these are 98 customer labs and all the agile teams. And we took all these backlogs and these epics and these, we actually use that language, right, in, in agile. We use the word stories, right, and chapters and epics. And we decided to create a graphic novel about what would life feel like if the most important things of those 200, those 200 OKRs came to life in a really human way. And this was only, this wasn't like a big vision piece. This was just in a 12 month time period. And so this was the graphic novel that we ended up creating, uh, which told this story about how does, how does all of this technical work come together? How can finance insight help ordinary families get a grip on their hand, on, on their finances and notifications and communications can be more human and more real time. How can we actually support you in the world, in the real world without being logged into your banking, your internet banking model um, and, and lots of other pieces and concepts that just started to bring a sense of momentum and humanity into how we do work. And so we've only done this a couple of months ago. I think the jury's still out on how tangibly this moves us forward, but at least the conversation and the energy has been a lot more human. And actually in that work, there was this notion about financial growth and the team started visualizing it as like a little fish metaphor aquarium and it's like, what if that's so powerful can be taught in schools? What if it can be the way that like a parent can introduce their children to finances? This is a new kind of concept of a cafe slash accelerator bank where multi-generational conversations happen where this grandma and the granddaughter you know, education of finances is happening across family lines. And the, and the fish was just like a, a placeholder. It's like we weren't sure what the metaphor would be, but it actually started a really cool conversation. This is the, uh, the archives of the Bank of Scotland, which is one of Lloyd's Bank and Group's uh, 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 banking uh, brands. And we went to the archives, and it was so cool to actually go down and see the founding documents from like the 1500s. And uh, this document in particular, you guys know what this is? Yes, this is a ledger. And it's so interesting because, you know, back in the day, the ledger wasn't the way that bankers innovated. If there was like a TED talk in the 1500s, someone, some, there'd be a banker on stage that would be like, hey guys, I just went to my church and they don't have piles of paper for every single transaction. What they do is they take a big book and they record one line for every charitable contribution 
and they like give structure to it. Here's the date, here's the amount, here's the time, and because they're really efficient. And wouldn't that be such a cool way to manage your finances? Searchable, it's compact, all of that. And, and so the whole financial industry in the 1500s saw that innovation and said, that's the model. That's how we need to manage finances. And it revolutionized data recording, it, you know, long before computers and spreadsheets were created. Now, that's awesome, but when you look at existing financial applications today, we still just freaking use the ledger. <laughs> like, it's been 400 years. Like, I think that it's probably time for a new metaphor or some new way of understanding finances, because clearly the current metaphor isn't helping a lot of us with our money in a really clear way. And so what's so interesting about the storytelling team is they helped us think about metaphor as a way of connecting in. So if you guys remember, I, I, I was around during this time, but this punch cards was the first way of interacting with computers. I see a couple people nodding their heads. These were from Jack, Jack Hard weeding looms from the 1800s. This is the first interface. This is the first metaphor for how do humans connect with machines. We then had this breakthrough of command line interfaces, which many of you engineers still use today, right? To kind of access the system. And then what was really interesting is this guy, Tim Mott at Xerox Park. He was doing co-creation with people in Xerox Park. Uh, how do ordinary people understand computers? And as he was having a lunch break, he went and he wrote this down. And this is called the office schematic. He said, what if we, instead of a command line interface or punch cards, what if we had you know, a screen with a mouse and we had this desktop? And what if there were files and a trash bin? And what if these fundamental things of print and delete and, you know, could, could be worked out? And this became the prototype that Steve Jobs then took slash stole into the first Mac and democratized access to technology, and we're still, this metaphor completely changed computing as we know it. And so I don't know exactly what our napkin sketch is gonna be in banking, but we're trying to create that moment. So our designers went into a branch, and we started having conversations with actual people, and we had them actually um, finish this question, my finances are like, and have them draw it out. So check these out. These are not like ledgers at all. And actually there's a lot of negativity. Right, check this out. My finances are like an endless to-do list. Or I like this one, an open prison. This one is crazy. It's like, emotionally I feel totally trapped with my finances. I don't know what to do. But the door to the prison is open. If I just had the right knowledge, I could get out of it. Like so interesting as to, to understand the mental model. And then my favorite here is the leaky bucket. Like the leaky bucket is, so I have this thing called the well. That's where my income is coming in. And then I've got this barrel where I want to save. And I've got a little bucket, which is my wallet. And I just, you know, I take some of my, my, my money and I'm on the way to the savings. But along the way, I hit Starbucks and Netflix and pret a or whatever. And by the time I actually try to like empty my bucket, there's nothing left. Like such an interesting way to help people think about their finances in a way that's just much more intuitive than just a bunch of numbers. So we're at the beginnings taking this research and this insight and applying it to banking. But my hope is that if I'm able to come back next year, it'll not be the behind the scenes of a, in the making of. It'll be a little bit more of the world's premiere of what hopefully will be the kind of new metaphor that can power banking in a much more human way. Um, so thank you so much for your time. I love just getting past this conversation and getting your thoughts on how we can help ordinary people make sense of money. If you have any experiments or learnings or suggestions, we're totally open to your thoughts and would love to hear them. Thank you so much. I think we have maybe one or two minutes, time for one or two questions, or one question, yeah? Uh, it is kind of uh, asking for some suggestions. Uh, I am handling uh, the payment uh, sector, uh, B2B payments, and uh, where uh, I have to deal with the B2B financial steps as well with my stakeholders. I have done my engineering, and I had not done any master's in finance. 
but uh, so far I am uh, able to get to know, okay, what is uh, the liquidity, what is the cash flow, rebate rate, the cost, kickback, markup fee on exchange rate, that kind of stuff. But uh, what is uh, your suggestion, like, should I be getting into the finance or is it kind of manageable stuff, being uh, holding an engineering degree? I think you don't have to be a designer to start connecting with the people you're designing for and involving them in the process. And I think it'd be really powerful for you, regardless of your backgrounds, to, when you're looking at the scenario, to not just do kind of a use case analysis of let me just take the current state and then let me do a service design map and kind of like, what can we do that's, that's new? Um, if you can involve folks in the process, I mean, even B2B transactions, you have, a, you have a customer, right? It's a business customer, and they're trying to get something done. And I think in the business side, there's a lot more stress in getting it wrong, right? If you, do, if you have a transaction that's not at the right time, and there's not liquidity, and you can't meet payroll, like the level of complexity that's required in that situation. So I would actually just involve folks there in a little bit of uh, role playing and improv around what the future could be like. And sometimes, now it's really hard. You can imagine a suited business banker who is like in a tie, doesn't have a lot of time for you, and trying to get them to get creative with like crayons and paper, or like, that's tough. Um, look at Liz Sanders' work. Go to maketools.com. It looks horrible on a, on a, on a, on a mobile phone because she used Flash. But anyway, go to a desktop site. Some of the tools that she used would be a great starting point for you to get a little bit more inspiration into how to take business transaction and actually turn that into something that's more powerful.